Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephen Keating. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, so every year, we're sharing more and more data online, as we saw in the video. And as an example, for photos, there's actually over 650 billion photos uploaded last year. And a huge amount of them were actually selfies, about 30%. Now, what is a selfie? Well, I thought we could start today by taking a selfie together, okay? If that's all right with you guys, all we need is a camera. And what I'm gonna do is take a photo with you. Hopefully, you'll make a goofy face, because I'm going to. And I'm gonna put it online later so we can share it, okay? So ready? One, two, three, do a goofy face or something. Ah! Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. I'll share that online later. Now, a lot of people think that, you know, taking a selfie and sharing it might be a little selfish, right? It's just photos of yourself. But in today's talk, I'm going to ask the question, in the future, can selfies actually save us? And I'm talking about medical selfies. So for example, instead of seeing your diagnosis as just a word, what if you can see it in novel ways and in novel dimensions? So for example, you could see the data where the diagnostic was made. This is actually a, a large brain cancerous tumor. But instead of just seeing it as an, as an image, what if you could actually see it as a, as a 3D print? So that's that same tumor printed, so you could have a, a tumor selfie, right? And you can go beyond that. What if when you take an MRI or CT scan, you can come out and press a button on your phone, and you can actually print it out in multi-materials? You could have medical students dissecting printed versions of themselves, right? It could, be, it could be amazing. And instead of just seeing your pathology as a text report, a paragraph, what if you could see your own cells? What as if, as a patient, you could press a button on your phone, download for free a biology textbook that replaces all of the images with images of your cells, right? Can we leverage curiosity on the patient side to access and enable with their data and to share their data to improve research? And yeah, this is actually a true selfie, as I actually took this image of my own tissue. And, and if we move beyond hospital data, Think about you know, Fitbits and all other types of data that we can collect outside. How come we can't make it a two-way street? How come we can't have patients inputting data into the medical record as well? So for example, this is a little extreme, what about poop sampling? So believe it or not, it's a commercial product where you can actually take a bit of your stool, send it in, they'll do genetic sequencing on all the bacteria in your stomach. It's called the microbiome. And I actually got a bunch of these for my family for Christmas, <laughs> which, uh, the highlight was watching my mom's face when she realized, I have to poop in this tube. And, uh, but the data comes back to you, so you're incentivized because you can learn interesting things about yourself, and if you share that data, it advances science. So how can we make this happen more widespread? Well, can we have a hospital share button? Right? We can incentivize patients to participate, they can feel enabled in their own care, make their own decisions, and they can advance medical research. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And actually, all that data that I just showed you, that was all part of my own medical selfie. I was diagnosed in 2014 with brain cancer. And uh, <clears throat> I, th I thought I would start out by showing you this image as a medical selfie first, and then diving into the details. So first, if we zoom in, this is my family and I after surgery at Brigham. You can see my repaired skull here. And down to my brain, these are the MRI scans where they made the diagnosis. Here they are actually opening up my own brain, and if we dive into the tissue, we can see the astrocytoma and into the actual mutated protein, the IDH1 protein, the primary mutation, which was formed as a single point mutation down in my DNA. It was a G that turned to an A. So in 30 seconds, you can tell that story. A patient can understand what's going on with them, right? And for me personally, it was a very large tumor. It was actually, this is a one-to-one -one scale of it, and it was in my frontal left lobe, where a lot of people say the personality is. So if I'm a little dry tonight, I have a good excuse, right? Um, and yeah, this was actually, this is my 3D printed skull. Um, and if you turn it around here, as a patient, you can understand very clearly that this is how they did the surgery. They went in, they cut out this part of the skull, and then they removed the tumor in four parts. Right? And as a patient, it makes it much more interesting to me. I don't care about spending a few hours in the, 
medical lab getting the test done, if I can access the data and I can use the data, and I can share the data so I can tell my friends and family what's going on, and I can show other patients what they're going to go through, right? So there's huge, huge potential here, right? And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But first, let me actually rewind and ask how I even got here. I'm not a, a medical student at all. Um, when I was young, and this is probably the same with everyone in the audience, I was curious, right? People are, are curious at a young age, and it's stuck with me. And I was actually looking at my brain when I was 10 years old. And that curiosity kept up with me and brought me to MIT, where I'm currently a PhD student finishing uh, work in how to make things, actually, mechanical engineering. Um, but this curiosity pushed me to always do research. I always wanted to learn things, and if I could get the data, I was incentivized. So in 2007, I volunteered for a brain scan. I was feeling totally normal, and I just wanted to see, what does my brain look like? So I, did a, I volunteered for a study to help science, and I asked for the data back. And they said, by the way, it's just a small abnormality. We don't know what it is, but you might want to get it checked out. So you can see it right here. And I got it rechecked in 2007 by neurologists. They didn't know what it was. I got it rechecked in 2010. It hadn't changed. There wasn't much concern. So I went about my life. Then in 2014, in the summer, I started to smell a very faint vinegar smell. For just a couple seconds a day, after about the third time it happened, I thought, no one's, no one's cooking in the house. And I went back to the data and realized, holy cow, that abnormality, that's near my smell center. I wonder if it's linked. So I went back to the hospital, asked the doctors about it. They weren't concerned, but I pushed. So they said, OK, we'll give you a scan. And they booked it for a month later. It's no concern. This is what it looked like. It had significantly grown, it occupied about 10% of my brain. And I was told, even though I was basically asymptomatic, I was told in three weeks' time they were going to cut that out in an awake brain surgery. So it was near my language center, meaning they wanted me awake and talking like this so that if they cut out the wrong part, they would hear my words jar and they would avoid that. So of course, I wanted to know what was going to happen. I was very curious. So I had the amazing honor of uh, being treated by Dr. Eno Kioka at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And I asked him, is it all right if we get a videotape? Because I would like to see what's going to happen. And he said, sure. And so, uh, I want to ask you guys, are you curious to see what that looks like? Yes. Okay, so for those that have a queasy stomach, you might want to close your eyes. It's going to be about 30 seconds of a time-lapse version sped up of a 10-hour awake brain surgery. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear me talking about how I met my girlfriend with my skull open. Okay, so here we go. It might be a little graphic. Close your eyes if you don't want to see it. So here I am in the surgery room. We're going to basically put the iodine, make the initial cut. And then if you listen carefully... Can you talk to us again? Uh, not long in, uh, a of now. Talking about how I met my girlfriend. There you can see them screw me back together, and it was the absolute most surreal experience you can imagine uh, to actually feel them inside your brain while you're awake. Um, and so it was so powerful for me to be able to understand what was happening, to be able to share that with friends and family, and share with other patients, right? Um, luckily, I, I had an amazing team. I was back on MIT campus three days later. I did proton radiation. Um, I'm still on chemo. I've been on a year of chemo. I'll finish it next month. And, um, but I, I was always curious. I always wanted to know as much as I could. So I tried to gather as much data, and I learned some really interesting things. So I'm not going to dive into it, but over 200 gigabytes of data. And if you're interested or curious, it's all online. It's all on my website. And I put this up for friends and families to look, and, and uh, I learned a huge amount about decisions I should make as a patient and things like that. The most interesting thing I learned was a question, and it was the process of getting it. Why did I have the least access to my own data? I found that there was barriers along the way, small barriers, but the smallest barrier to a patient is a mountain, right? You have to fill out paper, you've got to wait in the mail, it comes on 20 CDs. I don't even have a CD reader. I upload it. It's complex. There's no easy tool sets to use. I can't export it to a third-party site, and there's no way to share it. The burden's on the patient. And there's legal gray areas everywhere on the federal policy side. So for example, I still don't have access to my whole genome sequence from the tumor. So I was asked to donate part of my brain for research. Of course, they said, sure, I want to help. And I was under the impression I get access to that sequence data. And right now, my doctors can see my genomic sequence. It was done in collaboration with my university, MIT. So my colleagues at my university can see my genome. But I still can't. And the doctors and the researchers want to give it to me. It's a policy issue. 
But from my perspective as a patient, I'm donating part of my brain. It's super valuable, right? Why can they see my future and not me, right? If I get the data back and I'm doing my minor in synthetic biology, I understand DNA a little bit. Can I share it with the world? Can I put it on the personal genome project? Can I make it accessible to other researchers, right? It seems silly. So I started asking these questions more and more and connected with an MIT professor, Dr. Uh, van der Heiden, who studies the mutation, and he said, why don't you give a five-minute patient perspective in one of my lectures? So I said, sure, why not? You've been very helpful. And I, I did that, and I couldn't believe the, the response it got. They invited me to give a full lecture, and actually resulted in a, uh, a New York Times article actually published on my favorite day, April Fool's Day. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I thought the joke was on me or something. And I couldn't believe what happened. I got over 1,000 emails that day. Uh, thousands more in the weeks to follow, and they weren't just from patients. They were from doctors and researchers and patients, and they all said this matters. This is an issue. Keep, keep, keep asking that question. And so I did, and it actually got me invited to the White House uh, for the Obama's Precision Medicine Campaign, and believe it or not, I got invited the very first day after 49 days of continuous proton radiation which actually makes you a little radioactive. You take the Geiger counter, a little radioactive. So I'm standing in line for the White House thinking, Ooh, <laughs> I hope I don't set these off. But luckily, it was all fine. It's all very safe. So, you know, and, and of course, I had to take a selfie because I wanted to document what was going on. And so this was the best way to finish proton treatment, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, so I kept asking that question more and more. Why can't we have a simple hospital share button? And would it help? Well, if we look at the research, for example, open notes. There was a study done a few years ago at three hospitals where they gave patients full access to their doctor's notes. They found after one year, 99% of patients wanted continued access. Four out of five said they would choose a provider in the future based on having that access. And 70% said they took better care of themselves. And what about sharing? Well, it's obviously up to the patient if they want to share, but it, we can look at examples like Apple's research kit where it was launched last summer, it's very easy to do on the iPhone, when the tools are simple, people will share. They found 50,000 people joined in the first week, and over 75% were comfortable sharing their data with researchers. So how do we enable all of this? How does this scale? Well, what we need is a key to the data that the patient can control. And we can do that with an API, an application programming interface. And what that'll let it do is not just have the patient be able to download it, but be able to share it with whoever they choose. And it could be no one, right? Or it could be just themselves, family and friends and doctors. Or you could actually then have third parties and capitalism and the free market come in, right? We could have, with APIs, a Google Maps for health, a Facebook for health, a Dropbox for health. And just think about the, the scale. Facebook has over 1.5 billion people. Imagine there's a health tab, right? Imagine you let third parties come in and say, if you donate your MRI data, we'll 3D print your skull and send it to you. Or for me, I did something really goofy because I wanted to make it a light situation. I took my tumor, turned it into a salt shaker, and printed out a bunch and gave it to my family for a very weird Christmas tree ornament. <laughs> so, you know, you could have this thing where patients would be incentivized to gather data and share it, right? You could put that, in, that, that need to develop into the free market, right? So it could be really amazing to have patients as partners in our own care. And so if there's one thing to take away from this talk, it's to stay curious. And I wanted to also end by talking about the emotional side of it. So as a science person, I, you know, I was really focused on just making medical decisions and using the data for that. But the thing that surprised me is when I shared data, people shared back with me. And it generated emotional support. Support is medicine. And this was the biggest surprise to me. So right before I went into surgery, all my friends and family shared videos back with me, including for my favorite TV show. And this is what I got to see. Happy brain surgery, Steve. Hey, Steve, it's Jimmy Kimmel. We hope you get better. T-shirts. Steve? Steve Dance. Happy brain surgery to you. Oh, Happy okay. brain surgery okay. to you. So I never would have expected that would be so powerful for me, but it was at the time. That's what I saw right before surgery. So as I said, stay curious. We need to make healthcare a two-way street. And I'm going to end on a very personal note, but very quickly I want to thank uh, everyone who saved my life, including you guys for supporting Brigham, so thank you so much for all the medical doctors and friends and family and community, um, all the research being done in the field, and I'm still a grad student, so I have to put in my references. Um, I wanted to end on a very personal note. So imagine you're in my shoes, totally asymptomatic, and then you're told in three weeks they're going to cut out 10% of your brain. 
it changes your perspective very quickly. And I sent out a final email uh, to friends and family, just in case. I wanted to end with the three points from that email. Perspective is everything, and switching shoes yields most powerful thoughts. Family and friends are what remain when the world blurs. Gather data as often as possible and share it with the world. It could save your life one day. I never would have gone to the neurological folks if I didn't have the data, open data, from the research scan. I was talking about it back then, right before surgery. And the very last sentence of that email. The world is a lovely, splendid, and fascinating place. But most of all, to me, it's beautifully curious. So I want to thank you all. This is a very important presentation for me. I'm so indebted to Brigham and Women's. And thank you all for being here and supporting them. Thank you.